Amen. Wow. Resurrection Sunday. Man, God is so good. Good to be with you. And uh, man, I'm excited about today. I am excited uh, just to worship the Lord. I'm excited for what He has done, but I'm also super excited about what He wants to do in you today. Uh, so I hope you came ready. I uh, hope you are uh, got your hearts ready to receive because I believe the Holy Spirit has something absolutely amazing for you today. Hey, before we jump in, two quick things. One, if you uh, have not had the opportunity to give and you would like to, uh, in the, the brave new world, we don't pass offering plates, but we do have online giving, alaog.org. You can make use of that in the building. We have boxes by every exit. You can uh, give, give your uh, offerings there, and you can always mail to Abundant Life or do bill pay. Um, but we appreciate your giving. We don't require it. You're uh, certainly free to be our guests, but we recognize the blessings of giving if you want to in that we engage the promises of God related to our lives and our finances. So we appreciate your faithfulness in giving, and uh, we want to give you those opportunities. We have something uh, super exciting coming up April 17th. That's two weeks from yesterday, Saturday the 17th, we are doing a huge truckload food giveaway right here in Brooklyn, right in our parking lot. Uh, in this past fall, we did a couple, if you were around for any of those. Uh, this will be very similar. Uh, we're working with the same organization. They bring a whole semi-load of food. It is uh, a different contract, so there's a little bit different supplies in the box. These boxes have uh, some dairy, milk, and cheese, and I think some yogurts, but they also have uh, some fruit and like apples, vegetables, and some meat, uh, all packaged stuff in a box, like 40 pounds of food, and uh, we want to give away a semi-load of that. And so uh, we, what we need is a couple things from you. One, would you pray for a great, beautiful, sunny day, April 17th? Uh, secondly, spread the word. We have some advertising on our Facebook. You can like, you can forward, you can share. Uh, we'll be putting out some video announcements and things, so make use of those online tools. Also, you know what else works? Good old word of mouth. You can tell people. You can invite them personally. You can call or text or message people. And the goal is this. We certainly want to get... Uh, this gift of food to the most needy of our communities, but our, our goal really is to be a blessing to the whole community. And so uh, we're not restricting that. Uh, anybody can come and receive that, and it's okay. That's our goal. We just want to be a huge blessing to the whole community. We want to make sure we're advertising, communicating, and inviting with those most needy, um, but we want to invite everybody. And the other thing people can do is on the 17th, you can take extra boxes if you have someone to give them to. So if you have two neighbors that you know would be blessed by a box full of food, you can take two extra boxes and give them to your neighbors because we want to just multiply that blessing. So pray for that day, invite lots of people, and thirdly, we need help. So it takes about 30 or 40 people to... Uh, you got a question? Well, I will. You'll help. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you how to sign up. Is uh, First choice, if you have internet access, is go to our website, alaog.org. There's a, a little banner about two items down that says April 17th food giveaway. You can click on that. There's a pull down under resources. The very top line says April 17th food giveaway. Or you can type in alaog.org slash food. Any of those take you to that landing page where you can fill out a simple, simple little form that says your name, your phone number, and how many people you plan to bring with you to help. And that lets me know we have enough people. We need about 30 or 40 to pull that off. 8 a.m. to 11, three hours. Uh, the food giveaway is 9 to 11. We need you here at 8 so we can prepare, set up, pray, uh, get you in places, and then actually don't tell anybody, but uh, if all is ready, then we can start loading cars even before 9 because they start lining up. And so 8 a.m. to 11 on that day, if you can volunteer, please go to our website, sign up. If you don't have internet and can't do all that, stop by our Welcome Center. They have something that people used to use back in the day called pen and paper. And then we will take you that way. <laughs> and so that still works. Um, but either way, we'd love to have you uh, be a part of that day. And we just really felt like 
uh, the, the, the amazing gift of Resurrection Sunday and Easter uh, in the blessing, we wanted to follow that with something just super tangible that, that we recognize uh, there are real life needs and we want to just be a blessing. So thank you for helping us with that. Amen. Oh, you know, I read something troubling about the Easter season is that uh, 700 million people are going to eat these terrible little yellow things called peeps. I guess I've got to tell you I'm not a fan, but 700 million people are. Uh, there are something like 90 million chocolate bunnies eaten. And did you know 76% of people eat the ears off first? How many are ear eaters? Uh, that's pretty normal. I think I am too. There's about 5 or 10% that eat the feet first. But the troubling part was there was 5% that eat the tail first. That's just odd to me, but they do. They do. About $14 billion are spent on the Easter celebration. Um, now, I could make this a lot simpler, honestly, because all we really need is Reese's peanut butter eggs. All that other stuff can go, right? I'm doing this keto diet. I'm figuring eggs are good, right? Eggs are good. We can do peanut butter eggs, and uh, everybody is happy. So that's my two cents worth. Um, but truthfully... Uh, all of our American holidays uh, not, have, have become distracted, right? Become distracted. And I don't mind. I, like, I just like a good peanut butter egg. But I think much of the fanfare, celebration, food, meals, all of the activities uh, are not necessarily evil, but they might be distracting to the centerpiece, <laughs> of the, the celebration, which is Jesus, right? And uh, we certainly don't want to miss uh, all any other uh, festivity and celebration should be icing on the cake, but the centerpiece of our celebration is the, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And uh, we want to celebrate that. We want to talk about that today. We want to uh, learn a little bit today. I'm going to take a little bit of a different uh, approach to uh, to Easter Sunday, just because, well, so me and God had the talk, and I had a really nice other sermon ready, but that didn't happen. So we're going another direction here, and I think it's going to be helpful for you. I'm calling it Rescued from the Darkness. Rescued from the Darkness. What is the deal with darkness, right? We tend to have this averse uh, experience with the darkness. When I grew up, uh, we lived in this farmhouse. That was a nice enough house. Um, and we had a basement, and it was a nice enough basement. But there was one part of the basement that no one was a fan of. It was called a root cellar. It was in the back corner of the basement. It was dingy. It was dark. It was a bit smelly. But we, uh, we did the big garden. My mom did all this canning and, and stored it all in there. And somehow, it always ended up my job right, to be the one that had to go down to the basement, to the cellar, and get that jar of pickles or that can of whatever, tomato sauce. And, um, and so here's the problem. Our house was a, like your house, a normal house. You, you walk into a room, you turn the light switch on, all is well, but not the root cellar. This did not have a light switch. It had one of those pull cords from the ceiling that was halfway across the room, Right? So you had to not only go down to the basement, across the basement, to the back corner of the basement. All was pretty good at that point, even though you're alone. But then you got to open the cellar, and it's just, it was just at the right location and angle that none of the room light entered this room. It was kind of sideways. And so now you've got to go into this dark, damp, dingy, you know, a few cobwebs. And, and you had to kind of meander in there without being able to see anything and kind of feel for that string. Until you could turn the light on, and you hoped that nothing came out of there and killed you in the process. <laughs> rescued from the darkness. You ever had to be rescued? I, I, I don't know that I've been in a life or death situation like that, but, but I have certainly had moments where I was in a predicament that I couldn't solve myself. And needed some help. I remember I went through a little, little season. Thank the Lord, I think I've been delivered. But I, I, I locked my keys in my car like several times over a few year period, and um, I was pretty handy with a coat hanger and all those little tricks. But it never happens when you're around a coat hanger. 
right? You're at somewhere, some parking lot, some store, and, and so you're just stuck, and, uh, and, and you can't get in. Your keys are right there. And so uh, I did kind of pick up, after a while, there was this brilliant creation called roadside assistance, and uh, so, so uh, that saved me a few times where I was uh, in a position, not, not life and death, but just stuck where I couldn't resolve this myself, but I could call roadside assistance. They could send a tow truck dude, and he could open it up for me. But I was thinking back when, when Melissa and I first got married, uh, almost 30 years ago. Can you believe that? We were both nine, and <laughs> I know that's, that's young to get married, but... Um, and we were driving home from church, right, a good noble thing, and, and my uh, Ford Taurus that I got from my grandma, we were going to church in Adrian, I think we were living in Manchester at the time, when we stopped in Clinton, I just, I, I will know, this is 30 years ago and I remember it crystal clear, uh, in this nice Ford Taurus, we get some groceries and we go back out to our car with our nice cart of groceries, happy little newlyweds, and... Um, Yeah, the keys are in the ignition, and the doors are locked. And this was um, just, just, for those of you that are like in your 20s, God bless you, you don't remember, but this was just when we got cell phones, right? This was, oh, happy day. Hey, this is okay. Life is good. We can call. That was very exciting back then. And so we called her parents, and, and, and well, they didn't answer. So we called my parents, who are always home, and well, they didn't answer. So we called like everybody we knew because we had a set of keys sitting at our, at our house, but we called about eight, nine, ten people, and nobody was home on Sunday afternoon. And so what good was that cell phone? This was before I figured out this wonderful blessing called roadside <laughs> assistance. So here we are with a cart full of groceries, getting warm, and uh, we're locked out of our car, and, uh, and, and we can't seem to get hold of anybody. And we're 10 miles from home, a little bit far to walk, and we're just stuck. We're just stuck. And uh, now, how many know that when, when all else fails, when the, it's the deepest, darkest hour, there is one last thing? So we prayed. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it wasn't five minutes later, this guy walks up, hey, what's going on? Oh, we locked our keys in her car. And it's like, oh, well, I've got a Taurus. I've, I've, you know, they only make so many keys for those things. I've heard sometimes, you know, one car's keys will open another car, and he walks up, opens the door, and walks away. <laughs> Rescued from the darkness. On Friday, we have so much to celebrate. Good Friday, right? Just the... The, it, it's a, it's, in one sense, it's a horrible day, the, 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 the rejection of Jesus, the, the unright, unrighteous arrest, the abuse, the mockery, the trials, the, the beatings, the crucifixion, but, but for the believer, come on. I, I have this mixed emotion of, 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 of sorrow, move to gratitude, move to joy, because for you and I, it means forgiveness. For you and I, it means wholeness. For you and I, it means life. For you and I, it means that, that uh, Jesus paid the price and we are set free. And of course, Resurrection Sunday, come on, it doesn't get any better than that. Not only did Jesus conquer sin, but now he has conquered death. See, there's a little problem on Friday is that we are forgiven, we are redeemed, we are renewed, and we're still dead. But on Sunday, death has been defeated. Jesus is now the firstborn of the resurrection, raised up to the right hand of the Father, gone to prepare a place for you and I. Sunday was all about eternity, right? Sunday was about the new covenant. Sunday was about Jesus going to prepare a place for us that He might return, what, soon and very soon for His bride, the church. Sunday's a pretty exciting day. The resurrection power. The Bible says the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. Isn't that amazing? we got a lot to talk about on Friday and a lot to talk about on Saturday, on Sunday, but I kept thinking this week about Saturday. What is the deal with Saturday? It doesn't get a lot of press, does it? It seems like something's missing in the in this Easter story, because we have a lot of details about Friday, chapters, 
And we have a lot of details about Sunday. But what was happening on Saturday? On John chapter 20, um, one of the accounts of when the disciples and the ladies find the empty tomb, and I find something interesting, John chapter 20, early on the first day of the week, Sunday, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and he said, she said, they've taken the Lord and and he's out of the tomb. We don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciples started out for the tomb. They're racing. They're running. The other one outran him. They get in there. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there because he did not go in. And then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside, and he saw and believed. Uh, now, I've preached on all kinds of Easter sermons and all kind, parts of that story. It's pretty amazing about the stone rolled away and the angels. It's pretty amazing that, by the way, if you want to know what the rapture of the church is going to be like, we know that the burial clothes were still laying there and Jesus was resurrected right out of them, right? So the rapture is probably going to be just like that, just like the movies. Your clothes are just going to be left there. You, I don't think you're going to be naked. You'll be like robed in white. But um, all the clothes are left behind. Uh, talked about the folding of the, of the napkin, the Jesus promise of his return. But you know what grabbed me this year? Maybe it's because it's 2021. I don't know. But what grabbed me was verse 9. And it said this, They still did not understand from the Scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. They didn't understand. Now, you and I have the benefit of 2,000 years perspective. We have the New Testament Bible. We know the end of the story. They didn't. And, and we can think that they're foolish or what is going on with you guys. How many times did Jesus have to tell you that he would be dead three days and rise again? But the fact is they haven't been through this before. They didn't know anybody to ever rise from the dead. And the bottom line is they didn't get it. They didn't get it. John 20 and 9 says they didn't understand. And the reason that verse jumped out at me is because for you and me, uh, Saturday's not a big deal because we know what happened Sunday. Right? You see, when you are, are going to travel somewhere and you get out your GPS on your phone, you, you know where you're at, hopefully, at least your phone does, and if you know your destination, then you just plot out a nice little path to get there. Even if it's a, a day a drive or an hour drive, you know I've got a beginning, I've got an end, and I've got a journey. I've got a direction. We can deal with that. But what happens when I'm right here in, in a problem? We need a Savior. We are still oppressed by Rome. Sin is not, we've not figured this thing out yet. We, we, do, we need a move of God. We need a, a, a restoration of our nation, and Jesus is dead. We got a problem, and here was their problem. They didn't have a destination. What's the answer? They didn't get the resurrection. So they're stuck in the darkness without a solution. Now, the solution you and I know was on the way, but they didn't know that. They didn't get it. That made Saturday a little bit different experience. I imagine Friday was this day of shock, right? This day of, it was unbelievable, it was, it was traumatic, it was emotional, it was, it was defeating, it was loss, it was horrific, it was unfathomable. And Sunday, by the time we get finished with Jesus' resurrection, is absolutely incredible. But imagine those disciples on Saturday not knowing or not understanding the resurrection was coming. 
It was quiet. It was dark. It was lonely. There wasn't much happening. But for them to sit with their grief, <laughs> to sit with their struggle, Silent Saturdays. You ever wonder why the three days? Maybe you don't. My brain works that way. Why, why three days? We just assume it's, that's what the Bible was, but couldn't Jesus have gotten risen on Saturday? Could Jesus have left off the cross? Could Jesus have died Friday night? I mean, could have raised from the dead Friday night? Could he have waited nine days? Seven days? Seven's a good Bible number. Forty days? Three days. Why, why was Saturday stuck in the middle of Friday and Sunday? There's some good practical reasons. The, the Jewish tradition, uh, and really in that region, in that era, in that time, they, they believed that the spirit of a person would stay in their body for three days after they died. That might have had something to do with why Jesus didn't raise Lazarus up until the fourth day. That might have had something to do with why Jesus wasn't resurrected until the third day, so there wouldn't be suspicion that he didn't actually die. Possible. Jesus himself spoke of three days many times, so it was clearly uh, kind of had to be three days for the fulfillment of, of Scripture and the fulfillment of prophecy, but again, couldn't he have said nine days or three days or two days or no days? Some point to Hosea chapter 6 as a, as a prophecy. I think it gives some insight. Hosea 6 says this, Come, let us return to the Lord, for He has torn, but He will heal us. He has stricken, but He will bind us. And then in verse 2 it says, After two days He will revive us. On the third day He will raise us up. After two days He will revive us. On the third day He will raise us up, that we might live in His sight. Jesus referenced Jonah. You remember Jonah? The Pharisees, the religious people were kind of questioning him about things. And in Matthew chapter 12, he said, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. None will be given except the sign of Jonah. How many thought Jonah was kind of make-believe? Well, Jesus seems to think Jonah's the real deal. And I do too, right? There was a real prophet. There's historical record of a guy named Jonah uh, he was active in the prophetic ministry in the Old Testament. And Jesus said, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, whale, some kind of sea creature, right? the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Interesting. Why was Jonah in the belly of the whale three days? So if you remember Jonah, I'm not going to talk a lot about Jonah, but it's found in the book of Jonah in the Old Testament. And he was a prophet. That means he, he really, he was in ministry. He, he would hear from God and he would speak for God. He was, he was serving God in an active ministry as a prophet. And God said, hey, Jonah, I want you to go to this place called Nineveh and uh, tell them the gospel. Tell them that judgment is coming and they need to get right. And Jonah says, no way. They're mean. They kill people. And they, they really were mean. They were really known to be incredibly cruel and kill people. So he's like, nah. So he goes down to the port city and he gets on a boat and says, uh, Nineveh's this way. Where you, any ships going that way? And he gets on one going to Tarshish, the opposite direction, the furthest known uh, location uh, at their time of life, right? And so he's going, well, you know the story. If you don't know the story, you should read it, book of Jonah. But it says this storm starts coming and all the guys on the ship were, they're not, they don't know God. And they're like, what's going on? And Jonah says, oh, it's me. I'm running from God. <laughs> what do we do? Oh, you've got to throw me over. Get, get, throw me in the ocean and in the sea, and it'll all be good. So they do. <laughs> you don't tell me the Bible's boring. This is great stuff. They throw him in the ocean, and it says God sends this big fish. I don't know what it was, but it was something big enough. A fish, a whale, a whale shark. Whale sharks get monstrous. But all I know is it was something big enough that it swallowed Jonah without chewing him, and that there was enough room in its stomach for him to live for three days and not be digested completely. 
So it was something big, right? And, and, and it says that in Jonah 1.17, God provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside three days and three nights. So again, I ask you why. Why three days? So in that fish's belly, it says in Jonah 2, Jonah prayed. How many know that? That's a good thing to do when you're stuck inside a fish at the bottom of the sea. So he prayed. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave I called, and you listened to me. You hurled me into the deep, to the heart of the seas. And he goes on to talk about this seaweed wrapped around my head, and the roots of the mountains I sank down. My life was ebbing away, and I remembered you, and my prayer rose to you. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I vowed. I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the the, uh, fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Isn't that awesome? Come on. This is good stuff. Jonah is resistant, a little bit... uh, thick-headed, he is um, a little independent-minded, and um, doesn't want to do what God asks him to do. So he tries to run, and God says, well, we can do this the easy way we can do it. I want you to understand something first off. Didn't God offer him an easier solution? God said, hey, go to Nineveh. Like, you could have taken a camel caravan. You could have taken a ship. We didn't have to do the whole whale puke thing. But Jonah was stubborn. And he said, "Uh uh-uh. So God said, well, okay. And and so he goes through this whole drama of thrown in the ocean, swallowed by the whale. Now, let me just tell you what I think happened. We don't, it doesn't spell it out specifically, but the way it reads to me is he was in the water, the whale swallows him or whatever, and then he prays and gets puked out, right? Now, knowing the heart and nature of God, that's what God needed, was a heart of repentance and surrender. So I've got to think, and, while, and then he says, he says um, my life ebbed away and I remembered you. So what I'm pretty sure happened is, day one, Jonah's in this fish going, stupid Nineveh, seaweed, Fish stinky, stink fish gut. And day two, he's like, "Ah, digestive juices are not comfortable. And this is. But I got to think after a while of that, he's like, hmm. (laughs) He started to, to get humbled. He started to ask for help. He started to figure out this isn't fun anymore. Now, listen. Get the heart of God. I don't see where God wanted Jonah to suffer, but what God, God loved Jonah and Nineveh enough that he was willing to let Jonah go through something tough because that's what it took for Jonah to change his heart towards God. See that? I think, just like Hosea said, in Hosea 6, I think on the second day, there was a revival of the Spirit in Jonah's life. Still stuck, but he had a spiritual breakthrough, right? He began to pray. He began to call on God. He said, hey, some call on worthless idols. I will not cling to idols. He, he was all in, right? I will make good on my vows. He got really saved. He got really spiritual. He sold out to God, surrendered to God. On the second day, there was, there was revival in Jonah, and on the third day, what happened? God raised him up. God delivered him, and, uh, and he went and obeyed. Friday was the crucifixion. Sunday was the resurrection. So in Jewish culture, What was Saturday? The Sabbath. Saturday was the Sabbath in the old the old covenant and the Jewish lifestyle. It is the day of the Sabbath. It is the seventh day of the week. Sunday is the first day of the week. So they rested on the seventh. And so, isn't it interesting that God said, uh, 
between the, the suffering and the grief and the loss and the trauma of the cross, and before you get the answer, what you need is a day of reflection, a day of prayer, a day of, of seeking God, a day of quiet, a day of getting perspective, a Sabbath. Something like Jonah in the whale, where he said, uh, on day two, we got to do some spiritual revival. we got to do some work on your soul to get you ready for the victory of Sunday. For these disciples, followers of Jesus, predominantly Jewish people, they were kind of, I don't want to say stuck, but culturally they were required to celebrate the Sabbath. So they moved from this grief into, a, we can't do anything on Saturday. <laughs> and so they were forced into a time of prayer and a time of reflection and a time of rest and a time of being together. Exactly what they needed. Because Sunday was coming. They couldn't try to fix their problem. And if, even if they did, how many know they had, wasn't much they could do about it? Let me give you, uh, just if you're taking notes, write these down, three, three thoughts on three days. Uh, these, are, these are at least my observations, but I think they, they have some good scriptural precedence. Three thoughts on the three days. One, uh, write this down. Often we need to get the place, we need to get to the place of feeling helpless before we will seek the help of God. Now listen, just like Jonah, I don't think, that's, I don't think we need to get to a desperate place. But sometimes, can I say oftentimes, that's what it takes for us to get our attention, right? If we are smart enough and spiritual enough to seek the Lord and surrender to the Lord and obey the Lord and follow the Lord, without all of that, praise the Lord, I think you can avoid it. But let's be honest, as human beings, sometimes that's what it takes for us is to get to that place of feeling helpless before we go, oh yeah. I need to pray. I need to call on, on the Lord. God, God is my source and my solution in this time of trouble, right? Sometimes, often, we need to get to a place of feeling helpless before we'll seek the help of the Lord. Isn't that what happened to Jonah? It took a season, a couple days, <laughs> a kick a Saturday or two. Saturday... We're just going to use to represent a season of silence, a season of darkness, a season between our struggle and our solution. And he had a season uh, of loneliness, isolation, desperation, a season where he couldn't do anything to help himself. And what did it lead to ultimately? Repentance and surrender and worship and calling upon the Lord. And so sometimes that... Uh, is helpful to us. Number two, there are lessons and learning that happen in the wilderness seasons or the Saturday seasons that prepare us for the coming victory. Sometimes there's some things we've got to learn. We're not ready for all that God wants to do. I think about all the stories of the Old Testament. If you think about uh, Moses, he was in, in Egypt, but before he could be the great deliverer and leader of Israel, he spent 40 years in the wilderness. Learning about shepherding, learning the heart of God, getting a little bit of disconnect from Egyptian life and getting some reconnect to Hebrew life. It was a season of preparation. Remember Joseph, he got, right, he got kidnapped, he got sold into slavery, uh, he ended up going to prison unrightfully, but he had a several year season where it wasn't really punishment from God. He didn't do anything wrong, but it was a season of development where he learned humility. He learned to honor God. He learned to trust God he, and so that God could catapult him into a place of leadership. It was a season of development. I think of King David who started out with a sheep, right, out in the wilderness, and then he gets the you know, anointed king, and guess what happens? For the next several years, he gets to run through the wilderness, hiding for his life, before he becomes king. But in those times, he learned about leadership. He learned to gather the mighty men around him. He learned about war and warfare, and he learned about seeking God and worshiping God. Sometimes those uh, places of those Saturday seasons are what we need to get us to seek the Lord. Sometimes 
in our Saturday seasons. There are lessons to be learned in the quiet, lessons to be learned in the lonely, lessons to be learned in the struggle uh, that are really not for our suffering, but they are preparing us for the victory that's coming, right? All along, God had no intention of leaving Jonah in the bottom of the ocean, and God had no intention of leaving Jesus in that tomb, and God has no intention of leaving you stuck on your Saturday season. But there might be some things that we need to learn that are going to help us get ready for what God wants to do on Sunday. Let me give you one more. Sometimes we need a break before the breakthrough because God wants to do something new. Sometimes we need a break before the breakthrough because God wants to do something totally different. See, the disciples really needed to shift gears. They had it in their mind. They missed the resurrection. They didn't understand it. They still didn't quite fathom God's whole plan here. They still had an understanding or an expectation of of Jesus taking some kind of political leadership in the nation of Israel. And God will later in history bless Israel and help Israel and restore the nation of Israel. But in that moment, we needed spiritual awakening. We needed redemption. We needed the cross and the resurrection. They didn't get it. They needed a Saturday season to kind of grieve and to process and to let go of what they were holding on to so they could be ready for what Jesus wanted to do moving forward. A whole New Testament church, a new a new covenant, a new way of relating to God, the outpouring and baptism of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes those Saturday seasons give us space to let go of the things we're holding on to. Sometimes we've, we've got our own ideas, and until we let go of them, God can't do the new thing He wants to do. Sometimes we're stuck in an old season. It wasn't a bad season, but it's not our new season. And until we let go of that season, God can't bring the resurrection. And sometimes Saturday is just about grieving that loss, letting go and opening our heart to, for God to do something brand new. And i got to tell you something. I feel like that's for, for many today is the, the last season, whether it's been days or weeks or the last year. Come on. There's been a, we've been in a Saturday season for 12 months in some ways. And in, I, I don't think uh, God, just like Jonah, God doesn't want you to suffer and I, I, I do not believe God engineered a virus, nor, nor all the struggles we've had. But God is so uh, great at using what happens. The Bible says in Romans 8 that, that God works all things for the good of those that love Him and are called according to His purpose. So God can come into a, a Saturday season and He can move on our hearts. He can do a, listen, He can on the second day begin to revive us because something new is coming. We're on the edge of a breakthrough, and what we need is a revival of the soul. And sometimes, because we're a little bit thick-headed like Jonah, it takes a little bit of a Saturday season to push us into prayer and worship and surrender and yieldedness, the revival of the soul, so that we can move in that new direction God wants to do at the resurrection. After two days, He will revive us. On the third day, He will raise us again. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians talks a lot about the power of the cross. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 says this, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. Verse 13 For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. He's rescued us from the darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So he rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and he has redeemed us. That means that he paid the price to to remove us from the world system, from our bondage to sin. In Colossians chapter 3, I'm going to skip the, uh, the Living Bible there reference. Go to Colossians 3, 1. It says, since you have been raised with Christ, since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above 
where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and now your life is hidden with Christ in God. Talking about being born again. So he says we've been raised. So I want you to get those three things. That's what Jesus accomplished between Friday, Saturday, and Sunday is He rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. He redeemed us from our bondage to sin and worldliness, and He has raised us with Him unto new life. Isn't that exciting? There's a, a story, if you've got a couple more minutes. You got pot roast burning or anything? Can I come have some? <laughs> it's only 12 o'clock, so don't even think about it, right? <laughs> got 15 minutes yet. Uh, there's a story in the Old Testament that I'm, I'm sure you all tell around the Easter table, the story of Mephibosheth, right? How many of you ever discussed Mephibosheth over Easter ham? Uh-huh. Well, you should. So Mephibosheth, it's quite the name if you want a you know, name idea, if you got, you know, babies coming. How many have heard of King David? All right, we'll start there. King David had a a best friend, if you will, named Jonathan. Jonathan was the son of King Saul. Saul was kind of the bad king that was pursuing David, trying to kill him, because David was to become the king. So there's this weird kind of relationship here. you got King Saul, who is the king who turned bad. You've got David, the up-and-coming king, who anointed by God. Saul's son Jonathan and David have this deep friendship, which moves into what the Bible calls a covenant. That means that's why it's a picture of our covenant with God in that it's a mutual agreed upon. They really committed themselves to each other. And Jonathan, who was the heir to the throne, son of the king, he knew David was anointed. And their covenant was David, uh, Jonathan really said, you're to be the king, and I am I'm submitted to serving you. And, they, and David was committed to Jonathan. And they were uh, the best of friends, but they were more than that. They were covenant friends. That's important for this reason. As time went on, uh, in a battle, King Saul... Now remember, David's been running for years. And finally, in a battle, King Saul and Jonathan end up uh, dying in the same battle. And that is the end of the regime... David ends up being uh, crowned king. There's a little bit of chaos. Uh, the families of Saul are being removed. And in the process, Jonathan has a son named Mephibosheth. In 2 Samuel 4, 4, it says, Jonathan, son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan dying came to Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled. As she hurried to leave, he fell and became crippled, and his name was Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son. So that happened. Saul is gone. David is king. Mephibosheth is swept off with his caregiver, nurse, nanny. 2 Samuel 9. The dust is settled. David is king. And he makes this statement. David said, Is there anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Remember, Saul was Jonathan's father. David is saying, I'm in covenant with Jonathan. Now, Jonathan is dead, but I am committed to his family, his household. Is there anyone I could show kindness to? There was a servant named Ziba who was from Saul's household, and he said, hey, Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth. He is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Anybody ever been to Lodabar? King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. You ever wonder why the Bible gives you all the extra information like you didn't need to know? (laughs) 
The truth of the matter is Mephibosheth was a prince, right? Saul was king. Jonathan was heir to the throne. Mephibosheth was a son, a prince in line in the royal family, but now he is, he is hiding. Lodabar means uh, empty, it literally means pastureless, like it was, a, it was a wilderness, mountainous, rugged, useless kind of area. You couldn't pasture your sheep there, you couldn't grow anything there. Good place to hide because no one else wants to go there. Lodabar. Mephibosheth means scattered in shame. His name meant scattered in shame. So he was scattered in shame to a lonely, barren place, to the house of Makir, son of Emil, which means darkness. Emil means darkness. So he was stuck in the darkness, in shame, a place that was wilderness. Now listen to what David did because of the covenant. What did Mephibosheth do for David? No, he didn't, nothing, right? But what did David do for Mephibosheth because of covenant? Glad you asked. So he brings him in, and uh, he said, don't, David says, don't be afraid. I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul. Who was Saul? The king. That's like the fortune, right? I'm going to give you all the land that King Saul had, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? The king summoned Ziba, the the servant of Saul, and said, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul. Now you and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him, bring him in the crops uh, so that your master's grandson may be provided for And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Ziba, the servant, had 15 sons and 20 servants. So David says, you get all the land of Saul, and you get this guy Ziba, his 15 sons, and his 20 servants to take care of it for you. And you will always eat at my table, which is the place for the king's sons. So what did David do? He remembered Isn't it interesting that Mephibosheth wasn't looking for David, he was hiding. David was looking for him because he wanted to bless him because of covenant. Sometimes we get this idea that, oh, I finally found Jesus. No, he's he's been knocking on your door all along, right? The Bible says he stands at the door at Knox. That means he's already at your house, right? You just figured it out. He remembered, but he rescued him out of darkness, Right? He was in Lodabar, the place of barrenness, loneliness, and darkness. And he rescued him. He redeemed him. He was stuck in a place of shame and in a place of being alone and isolated. And David paid the price of bringing him back and redeeming him to a place of sonship in the family of David. And He raised him up or restored him. He gave him all the land of his grandfather Saul and all the servants. Uh, So he rescued him, redeemed him, and restored him. Why? Because of covenant. Because it it was called grace. It was a gift. And that, my friends, is what Jesus wants to do for us. When we are stuck in a dark Saturday... He wants to rescue. He wants to redeem, pay the, pay the price to get us free. And He wants to raise us up to something brand new, a place of deliverance in life. Saturday has some purpose sometimes. But God never intended to leave us stuck on Saturday. How many know He knew all along on the third day, I will rise again? Uh, he knew all along that, that Saturday uh, was a season but Sunday was the victory and the start of something brand new. And I've just felt today that, that I think for many, not everybody, some, some of you today are just living in the mountaintop. Praise God for that. Hallelujah. Right? But for some, you're, you've been stuck in Saturday. And I've got good news for you. You may not have seen Sunday coming. You may have been like the disciples who didn't 
comprehend what God was up to, but I'm here to tell you God has a plan and Sunday is already on the calendar. And God has a plan to do something new and exciting to release resurrection power in your life. And it starts when we begin like those disciples, when we begin like Jonah, when we begin like Hosea talked about, to have a spiritual revival in the, on, on Saturday when things are still dark. When we begin to seek the face of God and call upon His name and yield to Him and surrender to Him, when we begin to have, allow our hearts to be turned towards God, we know that revival leads to raising up to resurrection, and, uh, and I can't wait. So I want to pray for us today. Are you ready? I want to ask two things. We're going to pray in just a minute. Uh, if you have not made the choice to follow Jesus with your life, you don't want to miss Resurrection Sunday morning. There's no better day to be born again. Plus, I just got to tell you something, Jesus is coming soon, so it's not a time to play games with God. I'm not trying to scare you real bad, just a little bit, and let you know that He really is coming soon. Amen. It's a great day to receive a great gift called Amen. eternal life. Before we do that, I want to just say, how many would say, you've been stuck in Saturday? Saturday's not just a day. It might, it might have been the last 12 months. <laughs> it, it might have been the last 12 hours. But the season of life you find yourself is, I've got a struggle and I haven't yet reached the solution, right? I don't have a destination to put in my GPS. I'm, I'm still in the belly of the whale. I'm still uh, stuck on Saturday, ready for resurrection. How many just say, I'm, I'm in that place? Maybe it's a healing. I've been stuck with that thing in my body and I'm ready for, for victory. I've been stuck maybe in a just a you know, family relationship struggle, and it's like, hey, I'm, I'm ready for victory. Been stuck maybe in a, in a, in a stronghold. You know, one of the things that um, can happen positively in a Saturday season is we can call upon the Lord. One of the things that can happen negatively is we can also try to self-medicate or make the pain go away or deal with stress and hardship in our own ways with substances or with indulgences, right? So maybe, uh, maybe you've been stuck in a, in a behavior that you're ready to get out of Saturday and see resurrection power, see victory, see a new season. Maybe you've been holding on, waiting for a specific kind of answer, and God is saying, you're stuck on Saturday until <laughs> you let go because I got something way better, way better. Come on, resurrection power, Holy Spirit anointing. That, that beats, you know, a, uh, a renewed um, political empire any day. <laughs> How many say, that's me? I could use prayer today. I'm ready for the resurrection victory. Father, I thank you for victory. <laughs> it's a grace gift. But may we take Saturday seasons and use them for something amazing. May it be a time where we call upon your name. May it be a time where we, we grieve and let go of, of things that were, but also where we begin to anticipate and look forward to the things that will be in the future. But we know this. We know that Sunday was on the calendar from the creation of the earth. We know that you have a date and you have a victory established for us it's not the time to quit it's not the time to give up it's not the time to get mad it's not the time to to self-medicate it's the time to like Jonah did in my distress I called upon your name and you answered me so we're in agreement today the Bible says that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. That power that raised him up from the grave is the same power in our lives. And we are expecting, we are releasing that today for victory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now I want to lead us in a prayer. Christians, I would invite you to pray with me as an affirmation of your faith, prayer of surrender to Jesus. But if today you're online, you're here in the building, and you'd say, I'm, I've really never 
decision to follow Jesus. It took me a while to figure out I wasn't a Christian. That might sound weird, but I went to church and I equated the two as the same, right? And eventually I figured out, oh, <laughs> going to church is a really smart thing because you're around great people, you're hearing the Word of God, you're in an atmosphere of worship. It's a wonderful thing, but being a Christian is a surrender. Being a Christian is receiving the grace of God, repenting of your sins, making that choice to follow Jesus with all your heart. Once I figured out, oh, I never did that, then I did. Maybe you're in that boat where obviously you're listening or watching or attending a service. You have interest in God. But if you've never really made that surrender, today would be a great day. I want to lead us in a prayer, church. Let's pray out loud. Online, pray out loud. All over the building, pray with me. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, for your obedience to death on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for the victory of the resurrection. Today, I repent of sin in my life. I ask for forgiveness and a fresh start. Today, I choose to follow you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. I surrender and I declare that you are Lord, Savior, and King of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Woo! God is so good. Amen. Wow. Amen. Hey, it is Resurrection Sunday. I'm going to just pray over you for a blessing. Uh, we will have some prayer workers here available. If you have specific needs, we're happy to take a minute and pray with you. Um, but go with that heart of victory, knowing that resurrection is coming. We know that Jesus has resurrected, but in your battles, know that victory is coming, and, uh, and it's going to be great. So thanks again for being online. We'll be back every Sunday. We're continuing with the 845 and 1045 schedule. And remember to sign up for the April 17th food giveaway. So Lord, may we go in grace. May we go in favor. May we go in victory and joy in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here. See you next week.